So Ken, tell us how you assess presidents, the, what the three criteria are, and what would you give President Obama, Hillary Clinton, had she won, and President Trump? So I grade politicians uh, and, uh, in many different countries. Uh, and they could be the leaders, senators, congressmen, governors. I, I, I grade everybody every time I either see a speech, uh, read about a speech. So uh, for President Obama, for example, uh, I, I, well, for all leaders, I grade them on three issues. Can they grow an economy? Can they protect our culture? Can they protect us physically? Nothing complicated. Those are the three building blocks of any society. So you can't be wrong on those three issues. If you're wrong, you, you, should, you shouldn't be a governor or a president or anything if you can't do those three things. So I expect an A and an A and an A. But anyways, to ask, answer your question, President Obama would have gotten an F, an F, and an F. Okay, he was a failure of a president. Uh, Hillary, if she were elected, F, an F, an F. Um, president Trump, uh, I give a, a, a minus, B minus, and C minus uh, averages to about a B. And uh, I, I expect him to get an A, and I and I hope that he gets an A, and I would be happy to give him advice to get to an A, uh, but for right now he's B, but I'll take a B over an F, so I'm, I'm happy with President Trump. Just as a final point, uh, uh, grading, I'm going to grade Israel and Europe, if you want. Uh, Israel, uh, I, I would give a uh, uh, A, a B, and a B for the, th the three big issues, economy, culture, and physical protection. Europe, I give a D, a D, and an F. But if you average it together, uh, America right now gets a B minus. I, I, I want a B and I want an A. Uh, Europe gets a D, so to speak, and I don't know if they can be helped. <coughs> and uh, Israel gets a B, and I, I want them to get an A also. How could President Trump get a higher grade from Ken Abramowitz? Well, uh, my grades, again, are uh, for the growth economy, A minus. Protect our culture, B minus. Protect us physically, C minus. So uh, uh, he doesn't need a lot of help on uh, the economy. It, it's the culture and physical protection he needs help. When you're in a cultural war, remember we're fighting a cultural war and a physical war at the same time. When you're in a cultural war, you have to attack your enemies. The, the bad guys know how to attack the good guys. The good guys have to be as good as attacking the bad guys. So I'll give you an example. Uh, presidents have the ability to hire a fire 4,100 people. That's what the newspaper tells me. So he should have fired 4,100 people from the Obama administration, which he had a legal right to do, on the day he became uh, inaugurated. Raised his hand, took the oath of office, 4,100 people gone. He didn't do that. I'll guess that half of them are still there. So uh, number one thing he should do is fire the rest of the 4,100 people immediately, without even thinking about it. Just do it. Step number two, he then has to bring 4,100 new people in, which takes time. Uh, some of them uh, uh, require um, senatorial approval, I think about 1,200 of them. So uh, that's uh, step number two. And uh, then step number three, he has to go deeper down into the bureaucracy where you don't have the right, or the president doesn't have the right to hire fire, but he's got to figure out some way to move the worst people out and and uh, either promote or bring in uh, the new people. So he has to take control over the government. I guess if I had one comment to him right now is take control of the government. You're only president for four years. Uh, you have a lot of things to do. Uh, uh, you can't do them if you're not in control of the government. That would be my uh, number one criticism. And then he, he's uh, also got to get control over national security. His national security team is weak. He, uh, He's not appraised of the number of wars that we're fighting and, and the resources that are necessary. He knows it instinctively, uh, but he needs to more, more specifics. And particularly, he doesn't know about Iran's in, in, invasion of Latin America. Uh, this is, uh, we, we can't just sit around and let our, our number one enemy invade us from the south and surround us. It's a repeat, because I, 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 I spend time looking at Israel, it's a repeat of what Iran's doing to Israel. Iran is surrounding Israel. I can see that very clearly, but they're now trying to surround America. I can see that clearly, but Americans don't see that clearly because Americans don't spend as long a time looking at Israel as I do, and I do comparative analysis between countries. Uh, first, remember there's three big issues. How, how do you grow an economy? He and his staff know how to grow an economy, um, cutting taxes uh, and corporate tax, individual taxes. 
uh, is a good start. So I, I think he knows what he's doing in terms of the economy. I'm more worried about protecting our culture and protecting us physically. In terms of protecting our culture, uh, we have um, allowed political Islam to get too big. And uh, political Islam is the imposition of a religion on somebody else. Well, that's against our way of life. We don't, we, we don't say Catholics. You, you can uh, force uh, Protestants to become Catholic. By the way, the Europeans spent a thousand years doing that silly thing until they finally, there were so many dead people, they, they, they decided that Catholics can be Catholics and Protestants can be Protestants and we can live just fine together. And, and similarly with Jews and similarly with all minorities, that we just agree to disagree since we're 90% the same. We'll agree on the 90% that the same, we'll just agree to disagree on the 10% that we're different. Okay, that's called Western civilization. That's what we do. That's, that's the innovation of Jesus uh, of Abraham and then Jesus uh, together. So, um, so therefore, we, we should um, not tolerate political Islam. And there's four worldwide terror organizations. This, this is both cultural and physical issues here. But there's four worldwide terror organizations, and we have to destroy all four of them before they destroy us. Iran, uh, and number one, and um, ISIS al-Qaeda, number two. Those are physical terror organizations. And then we have number three and four, Muslim Brotherhood, financed by Turkey and Qatar, half friends, half enemies, and the Wahhabis, financed by Saudi Arabia and Pakistan, half friends, half enemies. We have to fight them culturally. I believe in fighting physical enemies physically and fighting cultural enemies culturally. And um, so we, we basically have to have a strategy to go after each of the four worldwide terror organizations. Right now, we don't have a strategy. You have two slides that show the difference between 3,800 years ago where false narratives were pressing down on society or centrists as you call them. What's the difference between 3,800 years ago and today? I describe what I call normal people as rational centrists and I color code them yellow in my speeches for the sunlight, sunshine of Western civilization. And, 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 and that means the primacy of the individual with guidance from up above, and the government serves us down below. That's what I call the normal relationship between God, the individual, and the government. And this is what I call normal. And uh, so today, it's about a third of the population, according to my calculations. I went back into time, 3,800 years to Abraham, which was the beginning of Judeo-Christian philosophy and, and, and the power of the individual. Uh, Abraham 3,800 years ago, and then Jesus followed 1,800 years later. So together, Jews and Christians created Judeo-Christian culture, also known as Western civilization, the most successful civilization in the history of the world. So we have a lot to be proud about. But in Abraham's time, there were only 1%, 1 uh, yellow. Abraham, his friends, family, tribe, surrounded by pagans. And uh, so Abraham fought against paganism. And, and can you imagine how brave he had to be when you're 1% surrounded by 99 and the other 99 have spears and knives and swords? So Abraham fought against that and created Judaism, which then uh, evolved into Christianity and now it's Judeo-Christian. So today it's up to 33%, but we're still, like in Abraham's day, we're still the minority. Normal people are the minority, and we're surrounded by uh, four, uh, four false narratives. Uh, in Abraham's day, there was one false narrative, paganism. Now, there were many forms of paganism, but it was all a false narrative. So the four false narratives, I color code them. So the Reds, socialists, communists, who believe government is God. They don't believe in God, so government becomes the God. And then the individuals down below as a servant to the government. Th those are the socialist, communist, progressives. Then we have the Blues, which is the United Nations, or in Europe, the EU, who believe in these superstructures. They're, they're, these are globalist uh, organizations who believe the UN is God, and then individual company, countries serve the UN, or the EU, and then individuals are even lower down on the totem pole as basically cannon fodder for what these mega organizations want to do. That's a false narrative. False narrative, the whites, color-coded white for the... Uh, for the um, surrender flag. These are isolationists. They're not bad people. They just think, I'm living in Iowa. I don't see any enemies. I don't know what the problem is. I'm protected by all these prairies or the mountains. I'm protected by the oceans. What's the problem? 
uh, what me worry. And so those are isolationists. Uh, not bad people, they're just uh, misinformed. And, and then we have green, which I call political Islam, the politicization of a religion. I regard Islam as a 20% religion, 80% political movement. So I'm talking about the 80%. That's uh, the politicization of a religion. And, and that's also a false narrative. You can't uh, impose your views on somebody else through force. And that's why I call it a false narrative. And so that's what we're fighting against every day. And our goal, job, is to get the one-third to two-thirds, to get the one-third normal people to two-thirds. And that's uh, what energizes me every day. And how do we grow the number of normal people who are informed and able to see through the fog of the media narratives and the war going on? Yes. Well, there, there's, there's two ways to um, get um, people who believe in false narratives to believe in true narratives. There's the physical force way, and then there's the um, just uh, stay strong and, and let them come to you. So my two models would be World War II and the Cold War. In World War II, we got Germany and Japan to become normal. We had to kill 60 million people. Uh, it was a tragedy of untold proportions. Never should have happened. Germany and Japan should have been stopped in the 30s uh, when it was easy. Instead, we waited for Pearl Harbor and then we did what was difficult. But that's the violent way to get um, people who believe in false narratives to become normal. The second way to get uh, that same effect is uh, the Cold War model. In the Cold War model, we stayed strong economically, culturally, and physically. We didn't kill millions of Russians and Chinese. We just stayed strong. And the bad guys, Soviet Union and the Chinese at that time, said, wait a minute, we don't have an economy that works. We don't have a culture that we believe in. And we're not as physically strong as America. I don't think we want to mess with these guys and gals. And they surrendered. They didn't sign a surrender statement. But in effect, they surrendered. And they said, we want to become like America. Uh, they didn't come all the way. They're still dictatorships. But let's say they moved halfway to America. We didn't move to them. We didn't become communists or socialists. We did, actually, we moved a little to them. But in general, they moved to us. So, so that's my preferred model. Just stay strong economically, culturally, and physically. Let the bad guys uh, realize that they're going to lose and let them move to us. Well, I look at life uh, the same way I look at uh, a Star Wars movie or a John Wayne movie. There's good guys and there's bad guys, and one of them's going to win. Now, 99% of the time, or almost all the time, in movies in America, the, the good guys win. But it's always perilous. Uh, if you look at a typical Star Wars or uh, John Wayne movie or Western, uh, the good guys are doing fine for 10% of the movie, the first 10%. <clears throat> then the bad guys get stronger and stronger for the other 80. And then in the last 10%, the cavalry comes with their bugles and, and they save the day, or Mighty Mouse say, saves the day in my uh, uh, younger days. And so to me, this is not a bad model for what's, what's going on right now is the, um, the bad guys are gaining strength and strength and strength. The good guys are not properly confronting the bad guys, and, uh, which I want to. I want to confront the bad guys right now. Think of it as we're in like 1936. Uh, we're in World War III now, but in the World War II model, we're in 1936, there's a lot of things we can do to prevent World War uh, II in a, in a shooting sense. And if we do them now, we won't have 60 million dead people. If we don't do them over the next few years, we'll move into a, a World War III model, which will be similar to World War II, and we'll end up killing millions of people. Uh, I don't want that. Uh, but the, the history of democracies is they're fat, dumb, and happy till they're attacked, and then they get very angry. I want to get angry right now before we get uh, uh, so many attacks. You have another slide that talks about the 10 wars facing America. Talk about that. Right. Well, because America is basically fat, dumb, and happy, and um, we, we don't understand the um, urgency of confronting our enemies. We think we're so big and strong and our enemies are so weak 
that uh, what, there's nothing much to worry about, or the police can handle it, or the CIA can handle it, or the army. But uh, our, Iran's the uh, number one threat that we have. They're building ICBMs to reach America. IC, ICBM intercontinental ballistic missiles are not needed to reach Europe or Israel. They already can reach Europe and Israel. They're building ICBMs only to reach America. And you only build an ICBM to put a nuclear bomb on it. You don't build an ICBM to put a, a normal uh, uh, explosives on. So in effect, the U.S. government is financing the Iranian nuclear project, which is like, you can't make this stuff up. I mean, and were we financing Hitler? You know, hello. And so uh, we, that's our number one threat. But we have other threats. Uh, the United Nations I regard as an enemy of America because two-thirds of the countries are dictatorships or terror organizations telling us, a democracy, how to behave? I don't think so. We should basically close the UN and only take the democracies, roughly a third of the UN, and set up a United Nations for democracies. Then at least we can have democracies talk to democracies. But I, I don't want to talk to lions, tigers, and bears. I want to fight lions, tigers, and bears. The lions, tigers, and bears don't want to talk to me either. They want to fight me, or America in this sense. And so uh, uh, closing the UN would be good. Uh, NATO has to be strengthened. NATO can't protect Europe from either uh, Russia or political Islam. Hello? That's, that's their function in life. It's like having a police force, and, oh, but we can't protect you. Well, get, get some new leadership or put some more money into it. Uh, European socialism, I regard as a threat. President Obama imported European socialism. It's called uh, Dodd-Frank uh, or Obamacare. And now we have to either pay for it or repeal it. Uh, and, and you saw with Obamacare what a mess it is to repeal socialism. Number five, Iran's invading Latin America. We're doing nothing about it. They have an estimated 40 to 50,000 agents, operatives, narco-terrorists, cultural terrorists, physical terrorists, invading uh, Venezuela and five other countries. Do something, hello. The Muslim Brotherhood's in jail in Egypt. We allow them to run around in America, hand out money, mostly to Democrats. Number seven, 80% of mosques controlled by the Saudi Wahhabis or the Muslim Brotherhood, teaching a false narrative to their children that Christians and Jews are the sons and daughters of apes and pigs. I call it cultural terrorism. Uh, uh, number uh, eight, we have Iran and ISIS just walking over under and around the Rio Grande. Hello, do something. Well, it, it, we're doing something there, but we should do more. Uh, uh, North Korea is developing nukes in conjunction with Iran. Iran is financing the nuclear program of North Korea to the tune of two to three billion dollars, military people tell me. And so uh, that's a mess. We have no clear understanding what to do about that mess. And then we have cyber agents from China, Russia, North Korea, and Iran attacking us every second of every day. So these are our, our 10 fronts. We have no coordinated strategy for these 10 fronts. We're losing on each of the 10 fronts, and I'm worried. And what's your hope? My hope is to save Western civilization. But I can't do that by myself. I, I, I'm too small, so to speak, and, and the task is too large. So I need help. And the help I need is, is from our leaders. Our leaders have to become leaders uh, and not followers. And so um, uh, I'm, I'm trying to help senators and House members, governors and attorney generals think. Now, governors have an advantage because they're, they're executives, like, like President Trump, for example. A president, by definition, is a, an executive, whereas the senators and congressmen are part of a debating society, which is important in a democracy, but they're, they're not really making the decision. But anyways, I try to educate uh, all of them. I can't see all of them physically, but I try um, to see about 100 a year and uh, help them... Uh, think or their staff think about very complicated subject matter, but I help them think about it in a way they'll get reelected, not in a way they'll get them unelected. What's your real job? What do you spend most of your oh, real time yes. doing? Well, all of this I do in two days a week of what I call public service. I spend four days a week uh, trying to make money. Uh, I manage a health care venture capital fund, which is a long-term investing, five, 10 years in the future. And I manage a healthcare public equity fund, which is investing five to 10 minutes into the future. So I'm one of the few people who is equally comfortable investing short-term or long-term. So what I did is take my professional analytical skills, which I get paid for, and apply them to national security as a public service. So I have a joke that I try to make more money during the four days that I work than I lose during my two days of public service. So I, have a I set up a website about four years ago 
uh, to save Western civilization called SaveTheWest.com, all one word. And so I have a, a lot of my thoughts on that website. I have uh, speeches on the website. I have interviews on uh, TV interviews, radio interviews. Um, I, I have a, a Facebook page, uh, Kenna Brownwoods, where every two days I have an interview with somebody and I put a little five-sentence five comment. Uh, so the people learn. Uh, first, I teach myself. I'm a professional student too. I'm a professor and student at the same time. So I learn from people and then I try to tell people what I learned and then play the role of a professor, so to speak. And I try to do that two days a week. And uh, so people can follow me at SaveTheWest.com and uh, Facebook under Kenna Brownwoods and they can subscribe and it's all free and they can learn whatever they, they want to learn. Are there any heroes that you can identify that sees as much as you're talking about here? Or where, what resources would you offer people who are listening to read more about this matter? Yes, there's, uh, I get information from, I'd say, roughly 100 heroes. And this is public information. I, I don't have any special access to anything that any other normal citizen uh, uh, doesn't have. So we have heroes like a Frank Gaffney. Uh, um, Center for uh, Security Policy and is a good example, uh, but there's about a hundred others. Um, Steve Emerson, Investigative Project, Egal Kaman, Middle East Media Research Institute, um, Itamar Marcus, Palestinian Media Watch. Uh, there's uh, Daniel Pipes does good work for the Middle East Forum. Uh, there, there's, there's about a hundred organizations that I monitor. I'm friendly with the people there. Uh, FDD, a Foundation for Defense of Democracy, and uh, uh, AEI, American Enterprise Institute. So these different think tanks and organizations and individuals and staffers uh, all feed me information, but it's not just me, it's available to the public. Anyone can buy their books, anybody can go to their websites, anyone can call them up and interview them if they want to. And so uh, I learn from these hundred heroes of mine and then I try to convey that information to our leaders, uh, whether it's in the administration or the um, senators, congressmen, governors, attorney generals. And I also do this in Israel and in uh, England. So I'm trying to help what I think are the three best hopes, so to speak, for saving Western civilization.